that's the way it's happened. I used to uh, be in San Francisco uh, when I was in the Navy, and I went to school there. I loved the city. I liked to run around. We went to San Francisco about every four days a week, at least, <laughs> all weekend. <laughs> and, did you like uh, the Navy? Yeah, I did. Um, I was an electronics technician and worked on radar, uh, yeah. all the different radars and things. So I was always up in the wheelhouse and uh, worked on the landing uh, systems and things. And wow. It was, it was interesting, exciting as a kid. I had fun too when I was in the Navy. Watch the planes come in, go off. <laughs> That's some of them exciting, isn't it? <laughs> some of them went up, some of them went down. <laughs> Did you work on a carri carrier uh, then, Rob? Yeah, I was. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I was in an old straight deck carrier. Cool. And wow. uh, uh, of course, when they came in, they had a certain landing procedure. You know, they tried to hook the first cable they didn't make that why uh, it was the second or third cable but some of them went into the barrier some of them went into the planes ahead some of them went over the side <laughs> you never knew what was going to happen <laughs> crazy yeah we had young, one young pilot he was he was uh, a daredevil and he had a he was a cat of nine lives um he came in and, and caught his tail hook on the uh, top of the barrier one day and knocked three planes over the side. And uh, oh, wow. he walked away from it, thank goodness. Well, and no. then he, he was out on flight operations um, with, I think, the, I think they were doing flight operations with the Italians. And uh, uh, two planes collided. He went. He was one of them, and um, we we searched for three or four days trying to find him in the water. You can't find a guy at sea, at, you know. Yeah. And uh, had, had a funeral for him on Saturday. On Sunday, <laughs> there was a, a fishing boat, Italian fishing boat that brought him back to the ship. <laughs> 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 he missed his own funeral. Wow. He'd been, in, he'd been in the That's water. Funny for story. Uh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Dehydrated, yeah. no food. <laughs> but yeah. uh, anyway. I was stationed in uh, Taiwan with the uh, Admiral staff working. I was a, a CT, and they, the Admiral was going to fly out to the carrier on a COD flight. And um, one of the officers was. And, and they said, you want you want to ride along on the cod flight to the carrier, and and that's where you sit backwards and land backwards and everything. Oh yeah, and I, know. Uh, and, and I said, uh, what well, is there a is there a good reason for me to go to the carrier? You know, and he goes, no, we're just gonna go. You can just go fly along if you want to. And I go, eh, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, then you, we had the old cod and uh, and things come in, and of course they had the. Uh, the prop planes and the jets yeah. on the on the carrier. I don't know how many we had, but uh, 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 it was a full front deck, okay, and and uh, also the hangar deck yeah. underneath. And uh, the ETs had the only uh, bunkhouse on the hangar deck. And so we had a porthole that we could, uh, and a uh, balcony that we could walk out on. And, and wow. so we were kind of privileged. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't down in the dark. Very interesting. Yeah. So what kind of what kind of planes were those that they were flying off your uh, carrier then, Rob? I don't remember. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure there were a lot of different ones, but okay. Yeah, they had all different models, but that... It was some of the first jets that they had. Okay, uh, all right. So kind of Korea they, era or or Vietnam or? Well, it was the late fifties. Okay, all right. So that'd be around the Korean War. Just before. Just before the Korean War. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, just after the Korean War. I'm a Korean War veteran by four days. Wow. Okay. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> I went in four days early so I could get the GI Bill. That's a long story, too. Hmm. Interesting. I'm yeah. reading a yeah. book right now. Uh, it's called Skunk Works. It's about the uh, Lockheed Skunk Works. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Fantastic book. Um, but, it, you know, it goes back to some of those planes back then. Um, talks specifically about a guy named Kelly, I want to say Kelly Johnson. Yeah. Who ran, yeah. ran the Skunk, skunk Works. Um, right. And, uh, yeah, I guess he designed the PT uh, or the P-38 and I don't know, a bunch of other planes and then goes up through the the uh, Ben Rich who was involved with the, um, you know, the stealth technology and, and such. And yeah, it's a really interesting book. Um, pretty, pretty much a page turner as good as any uh, novel I've ever read. So yeah. Yes. Oh, it's one and of my they, favorite planes. Oh yeah. They had the and, doc the, and the P 39. I don't know if you know what a P 39 is, but uh, I do not. It's one better. I guess. Many of those around. Is it a fighter as well, or? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I have seen one of these before. Yeah, I've seen these before. Yeah. P thirty nine is a neat plane. Yeah. yeah, the air cobra. Okay, yeah, I've seen those before. Um, I didn't know they were P thirty nine. Okay, yeah. Wow. And then a Black Widow. You ever seen oh, a Black wow. Widow? Uh, I'm not sure. Cool. I mean, the spider, yeah, but. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, it's a black widow. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It kind of looks like a um, mostly a uh, B twenty five, but a twin tail thing. It's a twin. So, yeah. Huh. I was going to tell you, Ben. Uh, yesterday they had a documentary on uh, the Skunk Works on on uh, the History Channel. Oh, really? Okay, good. Okay. So cool. everything you, everything you were talking about, I'm going. Yep, that was it. Yep, I got that. I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really. I mean, it's really an interesting book. I thought. Um, you know, going into some of the things I like, I I never would have thought of like um, the uh, the B two like the part I'm at right now is talking about the B two the B two bomber right, right. And how how they cut the B one and uh, right when Reagan came into office, um, and uh, they they uh, were pitching for a two stealth bomber um, and Lockheed had done the the um, SR-71 as well as the um, F-117 stealth mm -hmm. fighter and their technology right. was like, well, the guy who wrote the book is Ben Rich, so he's the head of Lockheed Martin. So Ben Rich wrote he, the book? What's that? I say Ben Rich wrote that book. I'm pretty sure it's him. Yeah, he was, he was, he was the director when they made the stealth fighter. Uh, he was wanting to do the yeah. stealth fighter and, and uh, Kelly Johnson didn't like it. He's, he was against it. Yeah, he was. Yeah, so her, that yeah self -fine self -fine. personal memoir of my years at Lockheed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a memoir by uh, Ben Rich. Yeah, that's the okay. one I'm reading. I'll put it in the chat here. You guys can look it up if you want. But it's uh, okay. yeah, it's a good book. Um, but uh, it, the the thing I didn't think about was some of the political and uh, oh, yeah. um, the maneuvering of the Air Force and, and stuff and talking about how you know, like when they built the, the SR-71, they had six people from the Air Force that were monitoring, you know, safety quality, test procedures, kind of auditing the, the whole uh, skunk works process. And yeah. when they were when they were working on the B-2 prototype before, I mean, they didn't actually build the, B, the actual B-2. They were working on a kind of a pitch machine. Right. Um, but then they had like 200 uh, auditors in there. And he was talking about how, <laughs> how the Air Force had this, basically just a lot of overhead of officers yeah. that didn't have anything to do. And so right. well, let's See. send them off here and do that. Yeah, so it was, was kind of interesting. Um, it also kind of makes you a little upset about the politics and the military, oh, yeah. the military organization and complex in some ways, because boy, it seems like there's a lot of wasted money in there. But it, It's a wonder that we ever got things done, really. Yeah, that's true. Well, so he talked about like the original stealth fighter is, I don't know, you probably remember better than I did. It's been a couple of days since I read that chapter, but it was like six guys or 12 guys or something like that went off in a room for a week and basically came out with a rough design for the stealth technology and the stealth fighter. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you try and do that with a, with a 
oversight committee and all these managerial <laughs> staff. And you can't do that. You got to go toss a small group of really smart people in a room, right? Feed them coffee and donuts for a week, and, <laughs> and you get back a stealth fighter. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a yeah. product. Yeah. So, anyways. during during the the uh, war in uh, God, where was it? Uh, when they attacked uh, Saddam Hussein. Oh yeah, yeah. And okay. They didn't lose a single F seventeen on F one seventeen on that first flight. And all that all that hack hack was going up, and uh, they didn't hit a single plane. Yeah. They didn't know where they were. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see cool. Doug's out at his hangar. Morning, Doug. Hey, good morning. Can you, Looks like you can't hear you, you real good. I'm in my hangar and it's raining out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like well, you got the towel. Can you hear me okay or is it all echoey? I can hear you yeah, just fine. Good. It's good. Okay. Yeah. We hey, got a break. I was going to show you something I was going to work on here that might be of interest to the VW crowd cool. out there. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead and show us. It'd be interesting to see. Can you guys can you guys see the standard uh, top mount? Uh, yeah. Volkswagen, this happens to be a great planes engine. Can you see the yeah. oil cooler okay? Yep, we can see it just fine. Okay, if you notice, there's one, two, three, four, five, six cooling vanes across there. Right. And one of the common, at least I didn't know it was common until I, I communicated with Glenn Bradley, but one of the common things on hot days in your mid 90s or whatever, and you're climbing out, is these things get hot. And, uh, Last week, I was climbing out about 230 degrees by the time I started getting to altitude. Oh, wow, that's right on the borderline of where I want to be. And I've had it heat before, but I've usually leveled off, went up, cooled down. That's kind of what Glenn said, is take it in steps mm -hmm. as you go up. I went, well, I've got it. There's got to be a, a better way of being nice to your engine and still not uh, – Getting close to overheating it on hot days, and a lot of you guys live down south. Minnesota, we do get some hot summer. So I just got this in the mail actually yesterday, and I opened it up uh, this morning. I was online looking, like a lot of us do, and I ran across oil cool the Porsche engine. And I thought, well, Porsche, Volkswagen block, a lot of horsepower, a lot of heat. Maybe they did something different. And I am taking this out of the bag for the first time. If you notice, this is the Porsche oil cooler. And if you count, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cooling pins. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit thicker. Unfortunately, because of that, it's a little bit higher. But I gotta believe there's some more BTU yeah. thermal dispersion from this oil cooler than in, in the standard one. Right. Um, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna put it on there. There is some room you have between the top of the cowling and your uh, gasket here, if you have one. But uh, if I have to even enlarge the calling a little bit to make this work, I'm gonna do it, because I wanna try and get some more cooling to that oil, short of running a whole remote oil cooling system, because there just, there just isn't, isn't that much room, at least in my CX4, to put a remote oil, oil cooler. I've looked at everything, and I, I can't seem to find a spot. I know some guys have some room on the east side of the car building, but the way yeah. my intake's set up, I don't have that choice. So uh, I don't know if anybody's tried this or if it's worth it. I can you know follow up with you later after I get a few flights in on a hot day. But I uh, just wanted to share that with the group that these are available. They're out there on the line. Great Plains doesn't have them. I don't know about the Revmaster guys. And actually, this is brand new out of the box. And it was $38. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Oh wow! What, what you, That's a bargain. I challenge Mike Homer or Continental to do something like that. You think for a Porsche, it'd be you know, two hundred and thirty-eight dollars or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna get a little closer where I can hear you. Yeah, I was cool. looking yesterday, and it looked like oil coolers were two hundred and thirty-five dollars. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Oh well, yeah, cool. Where'd you get it from? Just uh, somewhere online there? Yep, it's online. See if it's on the box here. Like Rock Auto or something? Or? Um, well, they're so proud of their company, you don't put it on the box if it's got an address. 
That's made in China, imagine that. <laughs> I don't know. If I find it, I'll get it to you guys. Gotcha. Hey, Doug, this is Bert. I got a question for you. Yes. When your, when your spinner, is that a uh, fiberglass spinner or is that an aluminum spinner? That's aluminum. Cool. Those are hard to get, man. Um, actually, <laughs> I bought the engine and some of the components for my CX-4 from a guy that gave up on his KR2 project. And I just, like, hit the gold mine. I had this, the backer plate. The wheels, brake assembly for his KR2, I don't know where he got them, but they're off of Tomahawk. Wow. And, you know, to get Cleveland or whatever they are. Part, is it Cleveland? I forget what the brakes uh, yeah, general, av general aviation ones are. But, boy, they've been great brakes and mm -hmm. uh, a few other things, too. So sometimes it helps to scrounge a little bit. Yeah. Be good. Yeah, I'm going to pull this up here as long as you're right here and see if I can see this. Things get a little busy on the back of a CX-4. <laughs> you know, guys start talking about adding things and doing it. And I had to have my uh, – um, I'll go to the other side maybe. I had to have my um, mag taken out and – where'd you go? And um, rebuilt – and that sucker, to do that, I had to pull the whole engine off, pull it ahead, and then back it out so that I could get to it. Um, and I've done some things to try to keep things cool in there. Um, I've got some blast tubes. I don't know if you can see them or not in there. Go to the mag and go to the um, – you know, I got the fuel pump, I guess. And So I don't know. It does get busy in there. <laughs> Looks like a new engine compartment. And I've just got the regular, mostly steam gauge stuff here. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yeah, iPad in there too, then, for your navigation. That's an iFly 720, I think, the second generation of oh, iFly. Okay, gotcha. We'll take we'll this off. An iPad or what, but okay. I, iFly, all right. Very cool. Are you still there, Doug? Uh, it looks like it's muted. You lost him. Oh. Let's see here. Hmm. I don't know. Good morning, Martin. There's Doug. Whoops, I lost you. I'm back now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Looks like a nice plane. How many hours do you have on that now, Doug? Oh, there's just a little over 100. I, I don't okay. go long cross countries. I just get out and really enjoy a hour's flight at a time and and that's good. That's all right. So, uh, I've been working on the CX-7, right? Yeah. And uh, it's one of those, this week was a, uh, last week was taking a step forward, and this week was a couple of steps back, so, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> So uh, I my center, I, what's that? I have been there. <laughs> yeah. So my Taking center section bar is a, a now a um, nice paperweight. Um, so the the plans were just had there were some discrepancies on dimensions. So and I, I kind of figured that out last week, but I basically this week I was able to completely confirm it, and so I've been remodeling it in CAD so I can remake it. Had to order more part, more material, you know. Of course, so. sure. kind of one of those bum deals. But um, yeah. I'm glad to hear you're you're finding the accuracy of the of the dimensions. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, it was one of those where the right dimension was on one print and it was wrong on another. And I just referenced the wrong one. And so in looking at them together um, and Greg Mekas was uh, able to take some time with me as well and kind of go over it with a second set of eyes. And, um, but yeah, so, so anyways, and I confirmed that with, with Dave that uh, the dimensions were correct. So, so anyway, so he'll, I'm sure he'll be sending out some updated plans. plans. Yeah. So, it is what it is. So just got to redo that, but yeah, kind of stalled progress. Cause I'm like, just, you know, I'm getting ready to uh, mount those, um, the doubled angles underneath and kind of working on the, the seat, um, ribs and things like that and just and it's like it's just not working out and what's going on and before i started drilling rivet holes or doing a bunch of that i thought i'm gonna stop and figure this out and, and i'm glad i did and there's a wiener dog walking through my yard that's weird <laughs> okay no owner okay. these look like elaborate seats in his uh, cx7 do you know what they are um no actually uh in the plans no, it looks pretty. Looks pretty straightforward. It's probably something I can sew up. I think. Wow, well, they look fancy. They're nice. They're really nice. I'm not sure if he sent out to have them done or what, but um, yeah, they're they're nice. But um, uh, let me pull up. Uh, yeah. I know in the plans there's a there's a drawing of um, the seats. Let's see here. Or actually, I think it's in the builder's manual. I can share this with you here. Um, once it loads, let me show my screen here. Um, there we go. Uh, somewhere in here, there's seat drawings for the. I was thinking it was right at the end, but I could be wrong. Yeah, right here. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the dimensions of the seat back, the pad. Um, yeah, so seat cushion. I don't know. Looks. I don't know. That doesn't look too two bad. Two and a quarter inch thick. Yeah. So. But, yeah, they, they look really nice. Well, so. they look like about four inches in the pictures of the plane. That's why I asked. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, here, let's go to this one. I think there's some photos of... Yeah, there are photos in there. Yeah, like right here, this one? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see this. They look pretty fancy. <laughs> yeah, they look good. They look nice. I'd sit in them. Yeah. So... Now I wonder what they weigh. I don't know. Foam and foam and some, I guess what kind of naga hide or leather type stuff maybe. Yeah, I doubt they're five pounds or less. So it depends how dense your foam is, maybe. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, mine's coming along. It's it's just uh, I'm right here. I'm stuck at this this guy, this uh, center section spar. I have my my seat ribs and everything all cut and formed, and yeah, you know pieces going back and whatnot. But I'm just kind of that's I've been idling right there for two weeks now. It seems like it's just it feels like I'm not making progress. But I mean, you gotta got to get the dimensions right or else there's going to be other problems. So, but this is girl. I'll, I'll share my, uh, here we go. So this is, this is what I'm, uh, working on with the, the spar. So, um, trying to get all the rivet holes and everything nailed down, um, bolt holes for the various, um, uh, you know, with the, the side angle piece or the 
different uh, brackets and such. So trying to get that all nailed down. And uh, so like, here's the, the spar in the fuselage frame, right? So anyways, yeah, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm working on right now with, with this thing, trying to get that all just perfect. So what okay. CAD are you doing that in? I'm using Fusion 360 for this. Um, I'm kind of thinking about trying uh, SolidWorks again for the um, for the skins and the uh, tail and uh, wing skin surfaces. Um, Fusion doesn't have real clear information on how to um, un unfold a uh, a curved surface to a flat sheet. And that's what I need to do to get the matched hole, uh, the matched hole kit made. So, um, which one but, do you find easier, solid works or fusion? Oh, fusion by a long shot. Problem is, if it doesn't do what I need it to do, then I yeah. have to use. You know, um, I, I don't have as much experience in solid works. So that being said, you know, it, I'm. Um, but I, th I think that um, there's a lot of nice things that they did with fusion. Uh, like for for me, the cam being integrated is fantastic. Um, uh, like some of the things when um, one of the dimensions that was wrong, if I flip this around to the front view, um, the dimension. Let's see here. The di dimension between this corner here um, and the center line was wrong. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. So. So that, that dimension was incorrect on the plans in the one spot that I looked, which is where my problem is. Um, anyways, uh, um, so in, in order to um, change this uh, for the, the cam, um, I already had like my, my cam meaning the, so I don't know if you guys are all CAD, anyways, CAD computer aided design cam computer aided, computer aided manufacturing. So the cam piece, you already you you have your cut your tool paths. Um, it knows where where to cut, where to drill, you know, all that sort of thing. So when I realized that it was an inch wide, all I did was I modified my sketch to move it in an inch, and then my cam was already updated in Fusion because it's all integrated, right? So it's I had to I just had to tell it regenerate tool path, wait twenty seconds, and now I now I have the new cut path. So it's kind of great having that integration. Um, yeah, but you know, I mean, it, it's not that big of a deal to, to, uh, do it from solid works and use, you know, H HSM works or something like that for camp. But, um, yeah. So, so as you can see, I'm modeling just the, the rivet holes and bolt holes on half the spar. And then I just mirror that over to the other side. So. Have you ever used inventor? I haven't used inventor. No. Um, I'm, I used Autodesk years and years, like 20 years ago, a little bit. And then um, basically, I really haven't done too much CAD until the last several years. Like, again, I basically, I played with SolidWorks for a little while, but I'm kind of a Mac guy. So my, my more powerful computer is a Mac, which is what I'm on right now. And so I'm like, well, SolidWorks isn't available for Mac. So <laughs> let, me, let me see what's available for Mac, if anything. And usually smart. Want downloaded it and played with it for about 10 minutes and went, I can make stuff with this and cams integrated. Fantastic. Let's go. So, yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to have to split this rain and I can hardly hear you. It's really tough in here. So you have uh, a great meeting. I hope to see you again sometime. Sounds good. Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for surrounding your plane. Exactly. See you guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. Cool, so. yeah. So, so anyways, that's what I've been up to. Um, had a few other, few other things going on, but that's the, that's the main piece. So, um, yeah. How about you guys? What else? Is, what have you guys been up to, airplane related? Nothing. Crickets. Yeah. 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 We're all speaking at once. <laughs> I'm on hold right now. Okay, yeah, that's right. You're digging ditches, aren't you? Yeah. That concrete the four. Well, 
Well, I guess if uh, if you're finishing up with that ditch, then uh, and they're pouring concrete, then you should be back in business here in a couple of weeks, right? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Good. Hey, have you ever gone down to the um, Midwest LSA Expo? I have. Okay. You're talking about the one, the one that the, they have down in um, Mount, Mount Vernon, Vernon, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mount Vernon, Illinois. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been there a few times, and and it's always interesting. Mm -hmm. um, kind of southeast of St. Louis, like an hour or so, a couple hours. Yeah, it's a hundred miles from here. Okay. All right. Not bad. Well, so, so what is your impression of it? Good, bad, otherwise, um, that sort uh, of thing. It, it, it's a really nice event. Um, there, there's a lot of good people show up. It's not crowded at all, but uh, it's it, it's nice. I mean, everybody that uh, is involved in a, in light light sport aviation shows up there. A lot of uh, manufacturers like. Uh, Jabru, they had their planes there. Um, okay. It'd be cool if we had a a, a, a a couple Thatchers there sometime. Yeah, well, I've been talking with them about getting a booth there, and I, I haven't been oh. down. They told me that the number of people that usually show up, and I thought, well, man, this year it probably doesn't make sense to go. Um, yeah. But that being said, then, then the other side of it's like, eh, maybe since Air Venture isn't going, maybe people will flock to it, and it'll you know double the... Who knows? That might, that might be a good idea. If you do go down there, uh, I'll be sure to, to hook up with you guys and go down there. Yeah. Well, I think I th I'm, I'm thinking about maybe just going and spectating um, just to kind of see how it yeah. is, That's um, fine. which I think might make sense this year. Rather yeah, than I, don't, I don't know that uh, with, with the virus and everything going on, it might be a low turnout and uh, it might yeah. be a, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of effort for, for the, you know, a limited amount of, of uh, airs, airs. Yeah, return. Yeah, the, I, I don't know if the ROI would be great this year. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking then next year, maybe I do Sun and Fun, Air Venture, and end that one. Oh, that'd be great. You know, if I, if I, especially if I have a essentially complete airframe for the CX-7 to show. Right, right. You know, even if it's not flying yet, which I don't expect it to be, but especially <laughs> in this. <laughs> The center spar is going to be a the death of me here. So, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I had I had the exact same problem with my center spar was was from a kit built by Greg Wester Westerman, Westerman, yeah, Westbury, and uh, the dimensions didn't match up with the fuselage. And I'm going like, yeah, oh, that's weird. <laughs> so I yeah. had to modify. It. Well, so so mine honestly, I would I would use it if like even if I if I have extra hole drilled in it. I just put a yeah. bolt in it and I'd be fine. The problem is, is that I ended up with the way the bolts ended up working out. I'd have two holes that overlap and that I, I, I can't do that. That doesn't, I don't feel good about that. That's the problem, the problem I had Ben, but I had a, you had to put a spacer in there between the upright and the, and the spar. Yep. And, and I took out that, 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 uh, un, un, you know, that inequity in that spacer i put a bolt in the, the spar and then i put a bolt through the upright oh just, okay good. yeah i just made that I, I made it work yep yep yeah i think some of that stuff you know like like i said with you know with my spar the dimensions are wrong in a couple of spots or the, yeah. i made it to one part of the print and that wasn't right so anyways but um yeah so i'm getting that corrected and, yeah. the, and another, the, another thing i ran into was uh, the rear the rear spar carry through that that angle? Okay, yeah. Okay, when I listened to uh, the videos on on YouTube, he was talking about that, and when he was when he would talk talk about it, he would talk about the rear spar and the wing, and the rear spar going the center section yep. nesting, and they don't nest. They're opposite. No, they're, they're back to back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he would he would say they're nested, and I'm going like. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, because the rear no, spar I I faces the, the yeah the rear spar angle is forward, I believe. In the yeah, right. It, it, you're uh, you're right. You're back to back. You're back then, to back. Yeah, the, the rear spar on the center section is for, the tip is pointing forward, and then on the rear of the wing it points backwards. Yeah, yeah. So they're right. yeah they're back to back. So, so they're back to back, and and so when I when I went to when I went to install the rear spar carry through in the middle, in the center section. 
I must have measured the wing 200 times before I put that sucker in there. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. because I'm like if it has to if it has to be back to back, then I want it to be accurate. I don't want I don't want to sit there and go darn. <laughs> yeah. Because and, and it was it wasn't exactly like that that gauge that you make in the, mm -hmm. the plans. It, it that wasn't exactly right for me, and so I measured it on, on the on the wing to make sure it was going to mat. So we'll see how that works out. Yeah, let, here I'll show you what I did for that. Because um, yeah, it's it's not the same on the on the plans. Um, so let's see here. Let me jump back. Uh, CX seven. I'm just. I'll just show you the C, the uh, CX seven um, one, but. Uh, no. When you were seeing dimension errors, Ben, were you talking about the five or the seven? Seven, the seven. I had yeah. the same issue with the five. Because I'm basically redrawing everything because I, I'm trusting. You're, you're hitting the same stuff I am. Yeah, there's, you know, yeah. The thing about having CAD available to us now is that you can eliminate these follow-ups really in, you know easily you can add new ones but you can also <laughs> eliminate, you can eliminate them um you know really quickly and so that's kind of what i'm realizing like what i was trying to do with the bulkheads I'm, which are so very slowly opening right now um is i thought oh i'll just draw them up to the plans i'll get them cut it's an easy quick thing to do and then they'll be ready to go when i'm because i was waiting on materials i'm like oh they'll be ready to go when i'm ready for them and now i'm kind of getting worried because i'm thinking I've already found, you know, a handful of dimension errors. Am I going to hit that when I go to put the bulkheads? Or are there? Yeah. And so now I'm thinking, well, I want to, I actually want to CAD this, not every piece of it, but basically the main airframe framework. And then, um, and then switch back to, um, sorry, let me switch back to the design here. Um, let's see. Resource side. Um, I'm looking for no. This isn't what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for the oh yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm sorry. I was going... anyways. Yeah, so I thought well, you know, but yeah, I think now what I'll do is I'll I'll CAD the um, basically the main fuselage framework, and then take the bulkheads I've already um, designed or you know modeled, put those in there, make sure that everything looks good. If so, then I think I'll be I'll be happy. Um, if it doesn't look right, then I can try to figure out what's going wrong and and uh, make adjustments. But yeah, so yeah, this is so you're talking about these pieces here. These yeah um, yeah yeah. I actually yeah I just cut these the other day for the seven. But, uh, but because at the at the at the at the, for, at the front of that that for, that uh, gauge, it's just it's just supposed to touch the webbing, right? Yep. Yeah. So so here you can see there's the dotted lines are the um, spar caps. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is the webbing. Uh, it's just so supposed to touch the web. And then, <laughs> and then that's, that's supposed to, that's supposed to uh, uh, guarantee the accuracy of the rear, of the rear spar. Yep. But you see, if you go off the dimensions, you see where the drawn spar is? Yeah. Half spar is, and you see where yeah. mine is? Exactly. Yeah. It's, not, it's not accurate according to the dimensions. And so, um, and so that's what I was getting at, is, is yeah. I, I measured... Uh, a couple dozen times and, and, and I'm going like, this, this isn't making sense to me, but, but I, I, I measured and that's why, that's where I put the rear spar. Yeah. Let me show you the, um, let's see here. Let me hide that. Uh, why is that not showing? Secret origin bodies. I must have them hidden. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, here's the form block for the seat rib and you'll see, it's close on the lines, but you know, like because this is hand drawn, it's not a perfect ninety degree angle here, right? That's so, nice. you know, and then you come down here, and the form block I have to you know set it back because of the thickness of the material um, right. Right. and things like that, right? But then, and it's pretty parallel, but it's not you know dead on. Uh, but then back here again, it's you know the dimen dimensionally, it doesn't make sense to have this where it's drawn, right. um, and so then. You know what else is that? 
what are the problems does that cause, right? So, um, yeah. So that's yeah. that's been my 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 two areas where the the inaccuracy of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the most inaccurate things I saw. Yeah. So it's I mean it's not terrible, but this is this is the kind of thing where you know where as a you know if I'm manufacturing it, I need to get this. I got to get this right because I'm sending yeah. these out to people. Yeah. And I, but then, um, you know, but then from a home builder, a plans builder standpoint, how many times do you want to remake those form locks? How many times do you want to remake that, you know, yeah. out those blanks? I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so there are things that definitely can be done better. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, is, is there a way to incorporate these uh, CAD programs into, into his plans so that people have the right dimensions? I haven't talked to Dave about it. In the back of my head, what I'd like to do is as I complete and verify and produce, you know, in um, these parts, um, I can create drawings, dimensioned drawings off of these. And I'd mm -hmm. like to, you know, basically hand them back to Dave a sheet at a time and say, okay, here's this. Here you go. If you want to, if you want to supply it to people, great. If you don't, that's fine. Well, I, I would love, I would love what you're doing. And I'd love to see that, the people, the future people that buy plans have your drawings so they're accurate because yeah. that, that, like you said, you, you had to back up and rebuild your center section and I'm going like, it's critical. You don't yeah. need this kind of aggravation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get it because I'm like, I'm CX seven plans number zero. I mean, literally I don't have a number on my plans. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, I get it. Like I know that I knew that I was going to have some issues. And honestly, even if you drew the whole thing in CAD, you'd hit something. You, you're going to hit something that was omitted or missed. Um, that's true, but, but yeah, this, this is pretty far off, I think. Well, the the thing that's, that I get frustrated about, sorry, I'm, this sounds like a Bash Dave session. I really, and Dave does such a good job. It's fantastic. I don't mean it to sound that way. So anyone listening or watching later on on YouTube, like it's not meant to be that way, but it's just um, when you hand draw something and you don't transfer the dimension correctly from plan to plan, it just that's that's where CAD would that would solve that issue entirely, hundred yeah. percent. Because That'd be great. That'd but, be great. Uh, I, I started on the on the drawing board forty plus years ago, and it it comes down to, and I've seen it in other plans. I mean, I had one of the early RV four plans. Every designer has the same issues. They're under the crunch to take and get product out. Yep. And uh, I even offered Ben uh, to Dick Van Grunson to, to uh, help him with his RV6 plans because he was still doing it on the board. And I said, I'll do it in CAD. I'll just send it, you know. And he wanted nothing to do with it. A couple of years <laughs> later, he switches everything over to CAD. Yep. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think he finally saw the light that uh, the aggravation of hand drawing and cross checking between multiple sheets just got to be overwhelming. And I'm sure Dave is probably running the same thing. Yeah, I think, I think that, um, sorry, I just turned on the, the form block here so you can kind of see how they match up. It's kind of fun. I don't know. I always, I always find this stuff interesting, but, but yeah, I think, I think um, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing Dave's not real interested in learning, you know, learning the technology right at this point, um, which yeah. is fine. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Um, for me, it, it doesn't make sense to try to make each piece by hand and resell them because then suddenly that, you know, $20, $30 seat rib is a $800 part, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, it might work if it was a toilet seat for the air force, but, um, yeah, no. but, okay, yeah I mean, so that's kind of my process anyways so if Dave's not interested and I mean I'm probably more sensitive <clears throat> to my bread and butter is design work mm, yeah uh, about, you know copyrights and whatever but if Dave's not interested as long as you send out stuff as supplements and it doesn't say uh you can do whatever you want. So, you know, if you want to send out some, you know, it's like if people want, instead of laying out the ribs, because every these plans, I guarantee you, is different than everybody else's because paper shrinks and expands yeah. with the energy and all that. So if you want to make a send out a program so somebody can go down the Kinko's 
and plot out a rib profile on mylar or whatever so they have a stable pattern, I would do it. If you don't do it, I'll probably do it someday because then everybody will have the same airfoil. Yep. But there's, there's no way you can do it otherwise. So, you know. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing with the, um, with the, the way the, you know, the plans are, like you said, that, you know, the paper shrinks, paper changes, you know, even if you reproduce it perfectly, you're still going to have that human error of not following the line perfectly, things like that. Right. So, but, um, um, when you go and look at the plans, if you overlay them on the, the, I haven't looked at the CX seven plans for the wings, but the wing ribs, when you do that on the CX five and overlay them between the um, center section ribs and the main wing ribs, they don't match up there. There's actually, there's a inverse. Um, there's like a, a divot in the, in the wing rib at one point, which I'm sure is not supposed to be there. Um, so yeah, there's, it's just, um, it's, you know, hand drawing versus uh, computerized stuff. You can get it a little more perfect in the computer. Whether that translates to the real world is a little different, but you know, um, but yeah, I think, I think um, for my sake, having these drawings, these, the, not the, the print that Dave did, but the actual drawing of this, you know, this formed piece with dimensions and such would be, you know, I think that'd be useful for me for doing quality checking after I produce the parts. Right. But also, um, you know, to be able to provide that to you guys for, you know, building, making from scratch, um, be handy. So, but anyways, yeah, that's my process. Ultimately it'd be nice to have a set of plans that's more like Zenith where each individual part, because, I, I can sympathize with the guys or gals that are trying to scratch build that one have never looked at drawings before. Plus it's like, okay, where do I start? You know, you buy all this material yep. and the more you can break things down and kind of take that anxiety or learning curve out of the equation, the more people are going to build and, you know, a lot of people, they'll start out and they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm going to scratch, build. I'm going to do 100% myself. Mm -hmm. Well, soon they realize, well, I don't want to weld, so they build, buy all the welding stuff. Yeah. You know, and then pretty soon, oh, I really don't like pounding ribs, so I'm going to call up Ben and I'm going to buy all my ribs from Ben. You know, yep. so it sounds backwards, but by having it available for scratch building, I think in the long run, it actually drives more people to your door because they still want to build it, but they want to speed things up after a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, I very seriously looked at the Zenith, uh, building a Zenith. Um, and honestly, like bands, they're beautiful planes. And if they had plans available, I would have bought a set of plans at a minimum, but I probably would have ended up building a bands of some sort because um, if I could have started just putzing around the scratch building, I would have gotten comfortable with my tools, comfortable with, you know, sourcing materials and that sort of thing. But I also, once I got a little ways into building a tail or something, I would have been like, man, I'm just going to write a check for five grand for the tail, the rest of the tail kit, or I'm just going to write it. You know, I'm just going to save up and next year I'll buy the wings and the year after I'll do the fuselage. And I mean, you know, I'd have, it would take me six, eight years to do it, but I mean, I, then I'd have a van stuff, you know? Um, so yeah, I you're, I think you're exactly right, Martin. Well, it's like Zenith, you can do those in a year or two instead of ten. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a there's a guy that uh, um, real nice guy. He lives down in Florida. Uh, uh, his name's Alan. Um, anyways, he uh, we, we actually we were chatting on the phone the other day, but um, he got to know some of the guys in my EA chapter, and so he's been camping with us at EA the last few years. Um, but yeah, he's built, I think, three RVs and mm -hmm. like 14, I want to say. Um, did it about a year and a half. He's out flying it now. Um, I, like, I think he said it took longer for the from the time he 
requested the DAR come out to give him his um, uh, certificate. It took longer from then to when the guy actually came out than it did for like to do his fuselage or something like that. It was like, yeah. what, really? But yeah, I mean, it was like a year and a half or something. Crazy. Huh. But, yeah, their, their match hole is yeah. is really nice. But it's also not all. It's not, it's a lot of uh, buck rivets, you know, hard rivets. So it's not. Uh, it's not as. It's not. Everything's not a one man job on one of those. It's a lot of all the rivets too. Yeah. But that being said, like you said, Martin, they're matched whole, so you can. You don't have to. You know, as long as the parts are produced accurately, you don't have to figure out alignment, measure all kinds of stuff, and you know, you just go through the sequence. I think the other thing, though, that speeds this stuff up is the builder's manual. Having a more step-by-step -step process will really speed things up, even if you have to make the parts. Having Knowing that you need to make this part next and the dimensions of it accurately, that's going to speed things up. So. Yeah, I agree with that, Dan, a whole lot. So, you don't well, have to scratch your head and go, do I do that first or that first, you know, so... If if you really want to do it old school, then you can do what John Thorpe did. Okay. You build an airplane, then you take it apart, and then you have all your match tooling done. <laughs> That's oh. literally what we did. Well, he just went back and remeasured all the parts, and we, yeah, he literally made an airframe and then took it apart. So okay, there's what the skin has to look like. There's what the fuselage skins look like that's how we got all of the skin mm -hmm. and to use those as templates to drill holes and uh produce kits that way for match hole interesting I mean, that was before cad yeah well i mean that would definitely get the job done i guess so um yeah the the biggest thing right now that i'm looking at trying to decide if i want to fully cad up like on this this uh fuselage frame do i really want to you know be cutting and drilling these bent pieces or do i is that something where i just say for now we'll let builders figure that out on their own we'll give them good dimension drawings and stuff but they can they can cut and, and fit those or do i actually want to produce those because they're anything with angles is kind of a pain to do um i don't know if i ever showed you guys my my jig that I use for um, that'd be, that'd be difficult to jig up. Yeah, they're they're just hard to from a machining standpoint. They're hard to hold uh, securely okay. without chattering. Um, I break a ton of, of bits when I whenever I go and um, work on um, the the spar um, caps. So um, so I just how do, you hold yeah. the, how do you hold the aluminum sheets down on your table when you're uh, doing your cutting? So right now, because I don't have a million dollar table, <laughs> CNC router, um, I, so ideally you'd use a vacuum table, right? Um, exactly. I don't have a vacuum table on mine. So that's why I'm, I'm actually put my, my router up for sale and I'm hoping that I'll be able to buy a, a upgraded one with a vacuum table and a tool changer. But yeah, right now what I do is basically I put the sheet down, get it aligned and then I secure the corners of it. Then I go through and drill, um, you know, like the alignment holes for the, like if I'm cutting, um, say, like wing ribs or something, right? So I'll cut the, I'll drill the, the quarter inch alignment holes for aligning them with the form block. And then I'll put screws down through there to hold it in place. And then I'll go back and cut and drill. So, so it's a lot of steps and it's a lot of manual intervention there. Whereas if it was a vacuum table, I can slide the sheet on, align it, hit the vacuum switch and hit go and 20 minutes later, I'd have, you know, 24 wing ribs done or something like that. So you not build a vacuum table and uh, drill all the holes with your... Uh, yeah, so I can. Um, I've looked at that, but the actual vacuum pumps are very expensive. And so what I'm looking at is buying a used CNC router. Yep. So basically a vacuum pump is going to be about five grand. So I could build the vacuum table, basically build a torsion box frame and, and uh, you know, use right. MDF for the suction and seal the sides. And I mean, I've kind of looked at that and it's definitely, I mean, it's definitely a possibility and it's something I could do and it would work with my router. I have enough Z travel that it would be fine. Um, but it's about five grand for a vacuum uh, pump. Okay. Then I still don't have a tool changer. So a tool change spindles again, anywhere from five to $15,000. 
So yeah. now I'm at ten, at least 10 grand in investment plus a ton of time to make that box, which is not a profitable endeavor um, versus just saying, you know what, I'll sell my current table for 10 grand or whatever. Sure. And I'll just jump up and buy a 30, $35,000 table that has a tool changer and a vacuum pump in it, you know, and it'll be used. It'll be, you know, 2005 technology or something like that. Or, but I think that's probably the, the way to go at this point. So, yeah. uh, I mean, my work's totally fine for now. It's, it's great and it's accurate and everything, but it's just, it's, I think it's time to, to look into that upgrade. So that's according to how much production you're doing. Yeah. And I mean, and I do use it for a few other things besides uh, airplane parts. I, I have a little, <laughs> I have a side side business besides the the Thatcher airplane parts. So I, I do a lot of, um, I have a CNC plasma table that I do a lot of like decorative metal signs on and stuff. And, um, and then I also do some uh, sign work on the router table. So there is some business there besides just the, the airplane parts to justify it. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, the goal is to do airplane parts a hundred percent. So, or, or hire somebody to run the other machines for, uh, for the sign making stuff. So, but, um, Anyways, I had a power failure here, so I'm back on the phone. So, oh, okay. Guys, everything got messed up, but uh, I missed the first 10 minutes or so of the meetings. So I'll catch that on YouTube. Yeah. Well, and we, Bert, Bert and uh, Rob and I were having a little political discussion, so I'll probably chop that off and not include that in the YouTube video. <laughs> but, uh, but, but otherwise, it'll be there. <laughs> it depends whether we agree with you or not. Exactly. I'm not willing to take that chance. So. I think we'll just chop it off. So, um, no, we were, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't get into it, but yeah, there's sometimes I, I, I'm not a big politics guy. I like, I think it's interesting and I, you know, like discussing it, discussing it, but I'm also like, okay, that's one part of the life. And then let's talk about airplanes, you know? So, so yeah. but it was a good discussion. This was, yeah. Did you talk about engines at all? We haven't actually. That's so. That, yeah, there was the one guy on. Uh, I was hoping he was going to join, or I, I, I'm assuming it's a guy. It was uh, like Yuli, Yuli, uh, Yuri. Is it Yuri? It's like I U R I. I guess Yuri. But um, uh, yeah, he's been asking a whole, a whole bunch of different questions. But, um, but yeah, about the air, the engines, and so. Um, well, Martin, yeah, I guess you brought up the question. What, what Was there any thoughts that you had on engines or questions you had about different engines? Or, Well, I guess, I mean, I was never a Revmaster fan just because I was told many years ago that if somebody's really into home-built aviation, if they don't show up at Oshkosh, they're not really serious. And Revmaster, as a company, hasn't been to Oshkosh in probably 30 years. Hmm. I mean, Ralph goes, but that's about it. And he just kind of hangs out with Pat at his booth. Right. But uh, um, like I said before, I, I wasn't real happy talking to Joe. Ralph's, I mean, he's a hell of a nice guy. Um, but uh, I, I looked into some other engine alternatives. Uh, one right now is on hold because of the world economics. Yeah. But um, that's probably the way. If 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 it was available today, I would buy it in a heartbeat, and I wouldn't even worry about it. But um, which one is that? Uh, if you don't mind me asking, it's uh, the Moto Rave, M O. Okay. E O. Is it the R Brazil or something? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a Brazilian plan. Yeah. Right? So I mean, but what they did is they decided. Uh, the owner of the, their, their business is actually mining and making magnesium and silica and a bunch of other stuff and doing castings and stuff. Right. The owner is, is big into aviation, so they were make they make all the cases and stuff for VW and stuff. Sure. And so they say, well, why don't we just make our own engine? And then the more they got into it, the more well they want to change this, they want to change that. And I mean, they've gone way past. Uh, Revmaster, as far as getting a more truer aircraft engine, 
the price is higher, but it's very reasonable compared to what they're offering. But then about a year and a half ago, the owner decided that if he was going to do this, he wanted to have it uh, SAE approved. Oh, okay. Sell it in the, the LSA market. And so then they, that started a whole nother can of worms as far as certification. And then when the economy started slowing down in their part of the world for their business, uh, that whole project got put on hold. And that's where it's been for almost a year. Hmm. But it's a health nice engine. But, uh, so I guess when it comes down to it, I already have the calling for the rev master, but now there's changes to that. So I'm going, well, if I got to change a calling, I'd just soon, you know, just jump in with both feet and really change it to go with a different engine then. But yeah. uh, I'd, I'd like to see somebody that's flown something for four or 500 hours like Glenn has. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if it wasn't for Glenn, I wouldn't even called up rev master. I mean, right. Yeah. He, He's their best salesman. Revmaster should be thanking Glenn. <laughs> yeah, all the <laughs> yeah, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm now waiting for somebody else to pick up that ball on engines and uh, see what else is uh, out there other than the Revmaster. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Um, I've been looking at the. Originally, when I saw the Viking like five years ago, long before I got in, even heard about the Thatchers, um, I was like, "Oh, that's a that's a neat engine." And then, it, you know, like like was mentioned, I don't want to, I don't want to bad mouth anybody or anything, but you know, the, um, that Jan uh, Egenfelter, he has some history there with some of things, and um, oh yeah, I guess met him several times. Yeah, I mean, nice guy. Um, I think somebody made a comment about his he's kind of a salesman, which I completely agree with, but but. Um, but I mean, he has technology and there's a lot of planes flying his engine. A lot of people are happy with them. I think my, my, if I decided to get a Viking, I would drive down there, money in hand and go, okay, that's, that's the engine right there. I'm getting right. Okay. Here we go. You know, <laughs> if you know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> I would hand the money and take the engine I mean, at the same time. I would, I don't think I'd put a deposit. Um, that's, and I mean, it's probably not how they work, and maybe in reality, I would, I would uh, go ahead with the deposit. But I know there's been some um, some sour taste there. Um, the other one, Arrow Momentum, um, is Mark Kettering, I believe, is the guy that runs that. Wow, yes. go, go on YouTube and watch some of his videos, the technical discussions. Um, if you're into that, they're riveting. If you're not, they'll put you to sleep. But uh, but yeah, he's a he's a sharp cookie, and I think he's doing some good stuff there. Um, a lot of airboat stuff, a lot of. Um, yeah. Anyways, there's a lot of use of those. Unfortunately, I don't, I'm not too aware of too many flying ones or at least not publicly, you know, not like Glenn where he's talking about it constantly. Here's my issues. Here's my, you know, I love this. I hate this, you know, whatever. But, um, the one most recently I've, I've found out about was, um, probably about six months ago or so was, um, the, uh, Mohawk arrow. I posted a link to it on, uh, on the forum this morning or last night, but, um, that one's kind of interesting was the Yamaha, well, they have Apex and Apex. There's snowmobile engines. There's like the Apex is the older version and the Apex is the newer version. Um, they have a um, uh, P PSRU on there, uh, just like the, you know, Viking or the Air Momentum. Um, but uh, they seem pretty interesting. I've had a little communication with them about it, and it sounds like they're talking like 120 horsepower with like 30 pounds less weight. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me, although – with knowing that um, Dave moved the wing weights on the CX-7 in front of the spar to do get weight and balance right, losing weight on the nose maybe isn't such a great plan, but um, but they seem interesting. And then uh, Steve Henry, uh, who's a stole comp competitor, he has uh, who's it like Wild West Arrow or Wild West. I, I don't know what is it Wild West. Does, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's and he does. Um, I think so. I think it's the Just uh, line of airplanes. Uh, kit planes he's a dealer or something uh, but anyways he has a couple of those and so he has he's has i think at least two or three of those um, yamaha conversions flying uh, but i don't believe they're from mohawk they're from somebody in europe like sweden or something like that but um anyways but yeah there's there's a few options there um 
and, and I don't mean to occupy the whole conversation, but my, my thing with Revmasters, they look like great engines. Glenn talks wonderful things about them. I have a little bit of a problem with using a technology that was designed 80 years ago, give or take. Um, and it was d developed at 30 horsepower, 40 horsepower. And even in the seventies with like a super beetle or something, what maybe 50 horsepower, 55 horsepower. Uh, and now we're punching it out and cranking up the RPMs and we're trying to make it do, you know, double what is intended. I'm exaggerating, but that it's, it, that seems weird to me. Whereas you take a Honda or a Suzuki or a Yamaha, you derate it, run it at a lower RPM and get more horsepower out of it at the same weight, roughly. That makes sense to me. You have a, a modern design, you have, um, a Honda or a Suzuki, which have millions and millions of cars or, or boats or whatever made with them running it successfully. And the, the only thing there is then it becomes the PSRU or maybe vibration because it's an airplane um, purpose for an airplane versus for a car. So um, it, it, that just makes me a little more interested. Um, plus having, you know, FADAC, uh, having, you know, injected, uh, so you don't worry about altitude issues and tuning your carburetor and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. It's interesting to me. It doesn't mean that that's what I, where I'm necessarily going to go, but it's, it's very interesting. Has anybody ever looked at Freedom Motors? Uh, that's familiar. They're, they're Wankels. They have oh, a Wankel. Yeah. Um, and, uh, if you, uh, uh, get a three bay engine, from them, it's 150 horsepower, weighs 158 pounds. So these are basically Mazda then engines, I assume. Uh, they're converted. Mm -hmm. uh, no, they're they're built from scratch. They have the sole uh, rights to build Wankels. I don't know if they purchased the. Remember the problems with all the Wankel engines back in the 70s. So. I guess I'm kind of <laughs> a little averse to that. Uh, yeah, they, they rank right up with pose the carburetors in my book. Well, um, I can, they can either carburet or have fuel injection on theirs. I don't, they're not out yet. Uh, I, I don't know. I sent them a note yesterday to ask a bunch of questions as to when they're going to be available, what price. And they... Interesting. Freedom Motors. Yeah, I'm looking at their site right now. Um, and then they have uh, uh, one of these airplanes that have twin engines. They're like a commuter airplane on their site. You go to, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Hmm. They bought the design from OMC, which is a, a inboard outboard. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's motor. thousands of those out driving boats. Well, o o OMC well got bought out by uh, Volvo, and they're as far as I know, no longer around. Right, and and Rob, to be clear, OMC did a lot of IO units for uh like v6 and v8 engines so it's, right. they weren't all it wasn't like there were millions of the the rotaries produced um i, I there no, may have been I, yeah it says okay fifteen thousand engines it says yeah. okay um okay yeah so i mean so that's a, that's a good chunk but it, yeah it's not it, it's interesting i that's one of those two kind of like um uh the was it the uh rev uh was it auto rev Motor Rav, um, it's right now. I mean, if you're in software, it's vaporware right now, right? It doesn't exist. It's it's close. It, they're marketing right. it. They're talking about it. They're looking for investors, but it doesn't actually exist. Yeah. And you know, I, like somebody else said, you know, I'd be much more comfortable, you know, looking at a motor where there's 20, 30, 50 planes flying with it, and at least one or two of them have 500, 700 hours on them. And you know, that's makes me a little bit happier. So. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, a lot of a lot of choices, right? But um, I don't know. 
I know Sean, um, I think he was on a few minutes ago, but he has a either already bought or I think he put a deposit on air momentum for his CX five. Um, I'm not sure where he's at with that, but, um, I'm looking forward to seeing that. So actually I think I'm going to be heading out to, uh, Sacramento here early August. So I might try and hook up with, uh, hook up with Sean and see his plane. Um, so anyways, um, see a couple other guys hopped in here, Ken and Alvin Voigt. Daryl's on. Saw you a little while ago, Daryl. So morning guys. I think you guys are all on mute if you're uh, trying to talk. So, but uh, welcome and yeah, speak up if you have any questions or anyhow. So, so what are you thinking, Martin? What are you? You talked about uh, not being too interested in the Revmaster. You're talking about that yeah. uh, the motor Rav. If whether or not that comes to fruition, what other stuff have you yeah. looked at? Anything else? If I get down to the airframes done, then I'll I might end up with a Revmaster. That's kind of what Bob did down in Texas. Uh, you know, he got the airframe done, he needed an engine, so he, he went with the standard. Yeah. Um. But I think like Zenith does, the more options you have for an engine, the more bigger base of builders you're going to have to yep. work with. Um, I'm not a big fan of Rotex because I, I don't like the gear reduction. I don't like the cooling systems and all that. But there's probably a lot of 912 used in there that you know maybe somebody would want to pick up a used one and put in a CF. Well, yeah, and to your point too about having it, uh, it having some, like having an engine mount or a firewall forward or something for different engines. If somebody was built was intending to build something else, got a good deal on an engine, and then they change their mind and want to do a Thatcher. Yeah, that'd be yeah, that'd be great if they have a nine twelve from a buddy's wrecked whatever, or you know, somebody else swap something out. Yeah. You know. The UL powered engines, I just don't want to put that much money into an engine. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if you want the FADAC and yeah, the you know, more of the twenty first century type engines, you know, that's a nice engine. Yeah, I mean it appeals to me to some point some degree, but then the simplicity of the carburetor and you know that's I don't know. I I can go either way, you know. I <laughs> I like old stuff, I like new stuff, so but uh, I, I like I like large displacement, slow turning engines. You know, just cars, boats, uh, airplanes, whatever. They a while back, like maybe two three years ago, there was a real push. It seemed like for a bunch of manufacturers making diesel uh, engines. Uh, yeah. Airplane. Anybody have any? Knowledge of those they, where they're at or anything? The ones that they put, the Porsche engines that they put in the, like, Moonies, the last I heard, they are trying to buy them all back and get rid of them oh. because they, they, they're they more worried about product liability. Uh, oh, okay. The idea was, was to have turbine engines, or turbine engines, uh, diesel engines, because in the, in the rest of the world, outside the United States, uh, getting Avgas is either non-existent or very cost prohibitive. Right. And they were going to, you know, everybody was going to go diesel. And uh, Cessna jumped on the bandwagon too. And uh, after a couple of years, they pulled the plug on the project. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of like anything else. When the big boys don't get in the market, that either means the market's too small or it's There's not. There's a flaw or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know. I, I, yeah, Rob, what were you going to say? Look up D motor, D dash motor. It's yeah, a flathead. Yeah. And uh, I think they can run on most any fuel. I went to their booth the last couple of years at uh, Air Venture. Um, yeah, I've seen them at our Oshkosh a long time ago. Yeah. They're not, they're not a, a cheap engine either. No, they were expensive. 
It was a good looking engine though. Oh, yeah, they're, yeah, they're nice. It's compact. What did, what was the price on them? I guess I didn't, I don't think I ever caught the price. I think they're around twenty five thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're they're up in there with the road tax. Pricey. They're they're liquid cooled again. It looks like right. So yes. Yeah. The um, old flathead. Yeah. I, I was interested in mixed comments about uh, the Jabru engines because uh, when I was dealing more with Zenith on the 750s, they found, you know, cooling problems. They, they worked okay in the 600 series, but they didn't work for beans in the slower flying airplanes. Oh. Of, <coughs> but... Um, you know, in the Jabru airplanes are a, a sleeker, you know, they're not, a, you know, flying around at 40 miles an hour type. Yeah, they're 200 mile airplane, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I and sure. yeah. So I didn't know, I mean, because even the Australian uh, government a few years ago w was trying to put restrictions on the engines because they had so many crashes and fit engine failures so um i don't know this gen 4 that came out a couple of years ago maybe they fixed most of the problems i don't know but it, it's usually not the core of the engine that fails it's usually the accessories it's you know the ignition system or the carburetor fuel system something like that i mean it's not very often you have a crankshaft break unless you run a cast crank or something. And I guess that's the thing that kind of set me back when was Glenn started having problems with Revmaster. It's like, okay, you have, they make it. And if they're not around, how do you get an electrical system back up and running? Yeah. Yeah, and that's something where like going to the, like a, a um, Honda or Suzuki, Toyota, whatever based engine, your engine is going to be fine. It's just that prop speed unit or the, you know, the, the accessories, the alternator, whatever, um, you know, the, the engine core, you're always going to get replacement parts for that, you know? Um, so yeah, it's interesting on those, the PSRUs um, be nice to have a couple more options there. Um, I don't know. Well, the one credit, I guess, the uh, the aero motor. Uh, if they're running them in airboats, that's pretty hard service. So, I mean, the guys around here that run airboats on the Mississippi in the backwaters, I mean, <laughs> they're they're really pounding those engines. So, if yep. they can stand to that kind of treatment, um, they're probably getting them debugged one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of guys that run those around here. I, I don't know why, why you need an airboat in Nebraska, but I guess they do. So you see them every once in a while on a trailer driving through town. It's like, I guess airboat, whatever. So you have a lake big enough for them? <laughs> I mean, there's some like reservoirs and stuff, but they aren't real close here. I mean, there's so there's the Platte River, which is, I guess, now it's, I mean, it's a big river, but it's not Mississippi big. It's, but they used to say it was like an inch deep and a mile wide. Pretty, yeah, it's pretty shallow. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. But so I assume that it's some, you know, some That's tributary of that estuary, whatever you know. But I don't know. But uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. You see these big airboats drive, you know, on a trailer drive through town. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. People have those around here. So where is he going? Yeah. So funny. Hey, did I finally get my audio working? Hey, I hear you, yeah. Ken. I can. Hi. Can you hear us? Can, yeah. Can anybody see me? Can't see no. you. Okay. I, I, I was, I've been trying to get on since nine o'clock and it oh. doesn't recognize my camera. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. All right. So I'm actually on my phone. I can see you guys, but I, and I can, I'm talking over the phone, but 
I, uh, for whatever reason, this Ring Central doesn't see my camera uh, or the my headphones didn't work either. So I oh, just okay. shut. How about now? Can shut you, you down. Hear me? Turn. I hear you, Daryl. Yeah, I hear okay, you, Daryl. Okay, good, good. Well, I I haven't. I was kind of just listening in for the last couple of weeks because I'm getting ready to start a CX seven. That's what I'm fixing to do. Okay. But uh, Ben and I, you have you and I have talked before. Yep. And, uh, yeah, you're so down in Texas somewhere, right? Yeah, I'm in Spring, just north of that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because my, my buddy's a pastor down there. That's, that's right. Over that's New Year's. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So the way I'm looking at it is I'm fixing to try to get you busy, but I'm trying to wait on some of the flies to get out of the ointment, so to speak. So. <laughs> yep, totally understand. <laughs> yep. So I'm, that's I'm, my advantage. I'm working on it. My advantage: the engines, the 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 mismeasurements, the the shrinkage on the plans, the whole thing. You know. Yeah. So I do have a CX4 project that I started. I don't know, seven years ago, six years ago, that I'm fixing to take some pictures of and pull out of the garage and uh, to to make some room to start the CX7. So. Uh, Y'all gotcha. kind of look for that online if anybody's interested in, in the area. You know, it's good. Oh, I just bought a CX4 project. I know, I know, and I, I saw that, and that's. But mine's not that far. Actually, mine is uh, the 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 not the tips, but the wings and the spars, uh, everything down to the landing gear, the wheels. The, I mean, you know, uh, the brakes, the uh, the controls. The bulkheads, everything's there, you know, just about, just none of it's assembled except, you know, the wings. The wings are uh, started and I started sheeting them, but that's where I stopped the project. And I don't really want to go on with it. I'd rather do the six, so that's why I'm going to gotcha. stop there. You know, and if anybody's interested, that's what's, I'm going to put it up quick, you know. Cool. So, uh, I, am, I am looking for a Volkswagen engine to, you know, some kind of power plant I, I there's i have leads here in phoenix that I'm, I'm trying to work out to but there's no uh there's nothing firewire forward right now i'm just gonna worry about changing it over to a tri-gear and uh go over it with a fine tooth comb so i'm more intimate with what's going on with it i do have an interesting question the rear stabilizer is that just held down with four bolts on the CX4? Um, let's see. Yeah. Pull the plans up here. Um, yeah, I, I believe there's four bolts, but it seems like there's more than that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, because the, the inspection plate is off, and I have the inspection plate in the rear, and I'm looking up underneath, and there's the nuts are are, are riveted on, and then there's four bolts that go down, and I'm like, what keeps these bolts from backing off? <laughs> okay, yeah, so there's the, um, the spar, right? So you have... Uh, uh, There's four bolts there on the on the um, bar and then the false bar, right? But uh, yeah, I think. And then there's oh, it uses an anchor nut. Okay, yeah, the AN three six six F four twenty eight. Um. Here, let me pull. The, let me share this in, uh, so we can all look at this. But yeah, I'm I'm seeing exactly what you're saying. The four bolts there. I thought there was some. Oops. Yeah. Here. Okay. You guys see this? So this is this is what uh, Ken's talking about. There's the two spars, and over here you can see this the spars, and then um, there's the bolt on either side going to the angle. We're going to get some feedback here. Hello. <laughs> hey, Greg. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Martin, you're working on a CX4, right? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, there was a controversy yeah, about compressing those angles with those bolts. If yep. you didn't put a spacer in between them. Yep. So you might want to. I think uh, some of the guys were putting a, like a tube uh, spacer there, so they wouldn't uh, deform the spar. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't de de deform and spar. He was telling me uh, that he had it on. Well, here's here is my concern is. So I, I drove up here with the uh, with with the uh, um, uh, with it on the plane and the trailer, and the bolts actually loosened up, and I was like, wait a minute, what holds these things in in the air? <laughs> Once you're done yeah. with this thing, and you're you know you, I'm I'm like, is there? I I, I didn't I didn't didn't see any kind of lock on these bolts. I, I what kind of nut do they have on them, Ken? What's that? Safety wire on them. What kind of nut do they have on them? It's, uh, that nut is, uh, uh, riveted on, uh, to, to an anchor nut. Uh, it's one of these guys. On. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. So is that a plastic I, 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 zert there? No, it should no. be metal. I would not use the plastic. I wouldn't use that I, at I, all. Yeah, that that yeah, that's interesting. I I would think you'd want uh I guess I would think you'd want a, like a castle nut or something and then um safety wire. wire. Yeah, wire. Does that uh, I'd use, yeah, at the very least, I would use bolts with two heads and then safety wire the bolts together in pairs. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'm, I'm probably just going to buy some, some, from the, whatever bolts they are that are set up for safety wire because the bolts that are in it now are not. I mean, I, 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 that's what I was looking for. I was like, is there a castle nut on the end? So I got underneath and got the and inspection plate was off and I looked and it was one of those anchor nuts. And I'm like, yeah. well, okay. So you, you yeah. run the bolt through the stabilizer all the way down through. Uh, you don't want to crush it. You screw it on. And then what holds it? How come it doesn't back off? Cause it did literally back off while I was driving, driving. you know, on the, with, on the trailer, the three day trip to get it down here. Yeah. And uh, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> This would be a bad thing in the air. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll change those out then. That that'll be part of my to do list. My what I'm working on right now is is just going over it, and I'm gonna. I got the. I, I bought the plans for the tri gear, and I'm gonna move the landing gear back, and uh, work on that. Okay. You might. You might call uh, Dave on that too, Ken, um, on the, the nut there and see if there's something else he recommends. Um, you know, tell, okay. tell him you're that sort of thing. Um, yeah, he answers his phone and he's a sharp guy. Um, he can tell you, you know, if other people have had issues, what, you know, what he recommends. So. Yeah, I need to call him anyway and order the, order the landing gear, the, the front, whatever the size that S shaped. Yeah. That, that would be me. In the front. You'd call me for that. Dave's the designer, and I make the parts. So, but uh, yeah. So, how much are those? <laughs> um, I don't remember what I'm charging for them these days. I think it's just a touch over a hundred bucks. Uh, let's see. Go to my website right. here Oops. and take a look. Um, you don't have a blue light special? You know. <laughs> Maybe some days. Uh, let's see, landing gear we got here. That Kmart's out of business. Okay, yeah, this is about is. 150. So yeah. 150. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I, um, Thatcher Aircraft .com. Yeah, that's my site. Uh, yeah, and Dave's is uh, uh, Thatcher CX4 .com. Yeah, it's, I know it's a little confusing. Um, I got the rights to produce the kits and parts for uh, for the Thatcher designs. Uh, a couple years ago from Greg Westbury. And uh, so I bought this domain name and 
I trail craft. So, anyways, so let's got it. it. Got um, it. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it's not bad. Um, yeah. So, right, well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. No. No problem. Yeah. Other than that, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I simply, I simply haven't built a CX4. Um, I, you know, made some parts for them, but haven't uh, haven't done that yet. So. Uh, did anybody ever get any feedback on the uh, extending the forwards far? Yes, Greg. How? Actually, Greg is on, and he um, on the. I'm sorry, on the CX7. Are you asking, or on the CX4? No, no, on the five because the. Okay. Let me make sure we're talking about the same thing. You're talking about the CX5, um, the horizontal stabilizer front spar, right? Uh, where is it? Here we go, stable answer. Martin, is this what you're talking about? Uh, this this forward spar on the horizontal stabilizer. Martin, you're muted. Oh, Martin, you're muted. Yeah, I was uh, hearing some feedback. I thought maybe it was me. Um, yeah, that's uh, on the on the five. He stopped, and then on the seven, he extended that forward spar all the way to the tip. Yeah. And if if he thinks he needs it on the seven, there's a lot more potential tail load on the five with the tandem seating. So I would think that he would be upgrading the five to reflect the seven, in my view, but. Um, Greg, you're on. I know you talked to Dave about the the dimensions on that. There were some dimensional issues. Did he say anything about having the five, the CX five, um, have that full front spar as well, full width front spar on the? So, admittedly, when I talked to him, um, the conversation was focused on the seven, that being right. what I have the plans for and and what I'm building. So, yeah, I don't know if that's like a retrofit for for the five. I I can point out a couple little issues that you'll run into that will have to be reconciled. Um, one is that the forward spar, because it goes full length, it'll go out to the um, S4 rib at the end. And of course that spar is two and a quarter inches high, but the S4 rib is not going to be two and a quarter inches high at that location, 10 inches in front of um, the, uh, the aft spar. So that's something that'll have to be worked out. Um, now the, the fiberglass wing tips, if you buy those from Ernest Martin, they're gonna pretty much match that S5 um, full length uh, rib shape on that drawing. And you know, so maybe the, the S4 might have to be you know, tweaked on a little bit to, to make those spars or, you know, something will have to uh, come in place to accommodate that. Now you also have the control horn is a little bit different from the five to the seven, but I guess you're more worried about should the five have the same thing as the seven and really um, going back to that original um, question, I guess um, Dave Thatcher would really be the one that would would have to uh, um, answer that if that would be preferable for the five. I get, I get, okay, you, you, you got my curiosity because why did he change the horn? So the, we had a discussion about that on Tuesday or last Saturday, and somebody had said that it was a different dimension, but when I looked at the plans that I have, it's not. Um, so right now I'm showing the, um, the CX-5 plans, and here's the control horn we're talking about. Let me pop open a new tab and go over to the um, CX-7 uh, lands, and we'll, uh, uh, let's see, start. 
he he doesn't have enough dimensions on that uh, plan view of of the horn bracket to actually locate it. You almost have, you almost have to build the uh, elevators before you can set that angle. And that's actually something I think uh, Greg was saying that um, wasn't wasn't what you're saying that uh, to build that control horn you want to build your your uh, uh, elevators first and then basically make the control horn match that or was that maybe that was something else we were talking about um, and that and that may have been I think that's potentially what Don Larson had done oh that's right I think Don was saying that maybe that's who it was yes yeah. um, so I ended up buying the control horn um, from Ed Klepas so I have that and then you know I will essentially make you know the elevators uh, to to fit the the horizontal tail you know plan form view, um, the there is a slight width difference like that um, now six and seven sixteenth inch dimension on that um, closer in width, which is like it, it'll show up as seven and three quarters. I understand on the CX five. Is that the five drawing you have up there, Ben? So right now I have the seven drawing open. Okay. This Does that the have five. a six and so, seven sixteenths with three? Yeah, right there where your cursor is. So this is the five. This is six and a half. Down here it's ten and a half on the five. On the seven, six and a half, ten and a half. It's the same. Um, three eighths dimension here, three eighths dimension there. So yeah, there's no difference on between the five and the seven on the on the plans that I have. Okay. Um, yeah, suppose, uh, let me ask you this question. If you, if you go over just a little bit to the left and up where you show that control arm. This here. What, yeah, what is that, that distance that's shown from the bottom of that um, shaft down to the center line of that hole? Uh, one and 11 sixteenths. Yeah, so well, the but current. But it, it's not to the center line of the shaft, which is weird. It's yep. uh, from the center of the bottom hole to the edge of the upper shaft. Yes, exactly. So the current version of the CX-7 drawings um, shows that dimension now is 1 and 13 sixteenths, and that's Dave's sheet 17 dated uh, May 12. Now, okay, I'd already good. bought my control horn. My control horn is 1 okay. and 11 sixteenths, so I may just have to accommodate that, um, you know, when it comes to the control stick uh, uh, dimensions, you know, or, or, or some such. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to make a note um, that my sheet 17 is wrong. Yeah. yeah. The, um, so the, that bottom width, that wider dimension on the control horn, what, what does that show? Yeah, that one right there where your cursor is. It's 10 and a half on both the five and the seven that I have, the plants that I have. So on this current drawing, it shows up as 10 and seven sixteenths. Hmm. Okay. Um, and then that top dimension, which I believe you said you had, what was it, six and a half? Six and a half, yeah. Yeah, that shows up as six and seven sixteenths um, okay. uh, on this uh, current drawing. So I wonder if he just needed more rudder authority or something, or it's interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Or, or um, you know, the other thought that hits me, and Dave would have to answer this, but, you know, maybe it's uh, – you know, that's the actual oh, wait, dimensions as it actually seven turned out. That actually be narrower. Yeah, yeah, just by a sixteenth of an inch, which yeah, by I mean, a sixteenth of an inch. In home building, that's not very much. Um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm more more concerned about the uh, horn length. Yeah. Why you change that an eighth of an inch? Because again, the the fuse the aft fuselage is supposedly the same, the tail supposedly the same, and any any time I don't see consistencies, that's a real big red flag in my business. Yeah, you know, there's a reason we did it. it. I just like to know what the reason is. Yeah, yeah. The biggest difference being that forward spar being, um, you know, full width. Yeah. Um, now I will say this. Um, you know, there was a note that Dave sent out. Um, I don't know, semi recently, a month or more ago, about. Uh, in availability of 16th inch uh, thickness angle 
uh, right. for the three quarter by three quarter and one by one. And so to feel free to substitute one eighth inch angle um, in lieu of that. So now when it came to the, um, the spars of the horizontal stabilizer locally, I could actually get one eighth inch angle. And I mean, they, they cut it off 25 foot lengths. So I, I just got a, a bunch of uh, uh, 10 foot lengths. So I could make the uh, spar pieces, you know, without that splice in it, you know, one piece all the way across. Um, the tricky thing that you're gonna run into is if you look at the, um, the side view of, of the spars. Um, Sorry, let's go back here. So I was just double checking if it was still in stock, but yeah, um, the 16th, thickness is still in stock at aircraft. Yeah, stores. that's what that's what I'm hearing. So it should be doable. Yeah. Um, but I can locally get a, you know, a 10 foot length. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the view right there. Okay. Um, so if you scale the rivet location on that drawing is it uh, shows up as about a half inch down from the top and about seven sixteenths of an inch up from the top if you scale it, you know, dead on. But um, so I marked and center punched on my aft spar those holes right in the middle. It just had a better feel for it, you know, just that it wasn't, you know, down away from uh, the, the top of that angle. But the, the problem is going to be the, um, um, the, the rivet squeezer or the rivet gun reaching down in there to be able to get and grab those rivets. So I'm actually going to have to end up making about a three eighths inch thick plate that rests in there to pull the head of the rivet puller up away from that to actually get to it it's just too it's too tight it's just way up against everything and it won't reach down so that's well, just another little um thing that i didn't quite think through far enough ahead but um i hoisted out there so that so something else to talk about there is if you notice let's see was it here oh yeah the bend line i think that one's okay uh it seems like a while back we were discussing this and um, this uh, spar web was drawn on the other side. Oh, maybe, maybe it's on the seven plans. It was like it was drawn on the on the other side, but it actually needed to be flipped. So I, I, I don't remember, maybe it was on the CX-4, or maybe it was an entirely different part, but there was some question about which side the web should go on uh, because oh, yeah. of the joining parts, right? Okay, yeah. So where that shows up is in that side view right there. Right. Um, you see the spar web is on the inside of the angle right it, it doesn't span the full two and a quarter inches in the construction manual in the photos it's actually on the other side and it spans the full two and a quarter inches um i chose to follow the construction manual with the full two and a quarter inches simply because i had now one eighth inch angle and I would have to make that web again smaller than what it's shown, and it's really you know getting quite a bit smaller. So um, I went with the method shown in the uh, photos in the construction manual. And really, you have to take into account like the length and where the bend is for those ribs to make that all get accommodated. And oh, so, here's the other thing. Yeah. That's so then you super, just adjust yeah. the length of your center rib. I yeah. would think you accommodate that. You know, what is it? Forty twenty thousandths which, yeah, uh, yeah it, and then, is that it then? I guess that would well, be about it. Thing, okay. The other thing was the, and I, excuse me while I'm running around trying to grab my phone cable so my phone doesn't die on me, but in that center rib, there's that bend line indication. Okay, yep. Um, and, and that really um, will not tuck inside of those uh, one inch angles it's going to be obviously on the outside of it so that looks like it's indicated in uh, the wrong location possibly which would affect the uh, oh I see what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. Are, are the planes tending to be nose heavy or tail heavy does anybody know because if the planes are already kind of running towards the tail heavy side the last thing I'd want to do is add more weight that far right. aft right right um, well, well the, you know, Greg and I are, are building the seven, and so obviously it hasn't flown yet. Um, I know that uh, they've you know moved the wing tanks forward of the spar to uh, to move the weight forward. So I would assume that it tends to be tail heavy then. Because um, you only buy the angle once, but you're gonna deal with the weight 
for the life of the airplane. So, you know, if it, if it costs a little more money to get the 16th angle, I just get the 16th angle and go. Well, yeah, David yeah. told Greg that the, it, it wasn't available anymore. And Greg and I talked about this, I don't know, what, a month ago? Literally, I had just placed an order for it. So <laughs> it's like, no, 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 oh, it's available. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And to me, the advantage was um, not including a splice and having it one piece. Um, to me, that, that trumps the other disadvantages. Did Dave confirm you did not need the splice there, even if, if you ran it a single piece? Actually, he did say to add the splice plate in there, even though it was a single piece. Okay, I was wondering if that was, if that was the case. Um, it kind of makes sense um, to have that kind of a doubled area there. Yep, well, yep. He, and that's... The splice isn't only just for the splice, it's also for the compression. Yep. Yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> that's so. the kind of touches that home builders will assume that you know, if I don't have the splice, I don't need the spice plate. And right. it may be true in some cases, but most of the cases you're safe for just keeping it in there. Yep. Yeah, that is a really, really good point, and it's true. That's. I already have the uh, all the wing stabilizer tip so my uh the s5 rib definitely isn't changing but uh, i'll probably run my spar all the way out to the end and if i have to put a slight taper to get it to match the s4 i will yeah um when i was talking to don larson about that um he made an interesting point, and I'll just bring this up because I really don't ultimately know um, what the right answer is. But, um, and he had built, he's built like three, four other airplanes. Uh, so he's seen things like this, but his contention was that he was gonna make the forward spar full height all the way out to the end to the S4 rib and make a modified S4 rib because, um, it was going to avoid wrinkles in the skin because of that compound tapering and leading edge tapered and tapering and in, uh, in height. So I just tossed that out there. Mm -hmm. And my, basically, yeah, go ahead. My, my Dave uh, then have it running full length to begin with so that transition went from the end of the shorter forward spar to that forward. I know. Yeah, and I'm not sure what the process would would have been like for skinning a as designed five tail and what you know issues that represented. Uh, I, I just I don't know obviously. Well it, it I guess, Ben, can you check to see if the S4 and S5 ribs are the same on both airplanes? Um, yeah, they're, the, they're drawn the same on the plans. So, yeah. So if you, uh, let me jump back here. I was gonna discuss the splice plate here on the on that CX-5 and CX-7 wing. I've heard some people say that they're gonna use a 12 foot section here. Um, but I, I think there's some value to having that splice plate, plate there, even with the um, just because you're joining uh, the angle as well. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. But uh, yeah, let's go back to this. Was that uh, the seven spar you're showing, or the five? Oh, the seven and the spar are basically the same. There's, there are a few differences, but it's basically the same. Um, uh, I'll have to look again, but I thought I thought the spar web was 32. It was 40 um, on. The on the on seven, the it's forty. Yeah. So, so there were some. So, David said that the the tail and the and the wings were the same for the seven and the five. So people could get started on the on the their seven by building the wings and the tail. Uh, but when I got the plans for the seven, it shows that the wing spar is actually a forty thousandths uh, spar web instead of the CX five that has a thirty two thousandths. Yeah. Spar web. That, that's another example where making a blank statement that. You can use the wings 
okay, why did he go to 40,000? Right. Well, there's going to be guys that are going to, might have 32 webs, and now they need 40. And if right. he needs 40 on the seven, why doesn't he have 40 on the five? Right. It's the same wing. Um, yeah. Yeah, is that Harold? Yeah. Hey, Harold. Good morning. If you're going to build something, you can, if you add two, you can add to it, but you can't take away. Now, the CX-7 is certified for a 30,000th. You can go to a 40,000th, which is no problem. You just can't go down. You understand the FA thinking there? Uh, yeah, uh, you said CX-7. I think you meant the CX-5. The CX-5 uh, was specced with a 32 thousandths uh, spar web, but the I CX-7 thought, uh, is the 40. I thought the 5 was a 40 thousand. Nope, it's 32 thousandths. Stand corrected. Yeah. No, it's, it's, no you're exactly right, though. I, I, or from my understanding of it, not being an engineer and all that, but um, but yeah, we should be able to go from a 32 thousand. Like, if, you, if, if I built a CX-7 wing, you should be able to put that on a CX-5. Yeah, you're gonna have a weight penalty and some of those things, but it should work. Um, or that spar, I should say. Uh, and same with the tail. If, if you're gonna build a CX-7 tail that has the full length um, uh, uh, horizontal uh, spar, uh, yeah, that should be able to go on a CX-5 just fine. Um, I guess in my mind from, you know, from manufacturing standpoint, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I'd I'd rather have less part numbers on my shelf, and you you know just oh you're getting a five or a seven you get this tail kit you know that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that's kosher with Dave, so I'll have to check with him on it. But um, that'd be ideal for me uh, from my standpoint. Um, yeah, Martin, you were be. oh sorry, go ahead. No, I say you're 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 totally correct. I mean, if somebody orders a, a elevator stab from you, it whether it's a five or a seven, it should be the same. Yeah, and I, I just want to verify with Dave that that's you know that he, he's okay with that and whatnot. But yeah, I, I would think that'd be fine. Um, uh, um, Martin, I think you were talking about the the tail here. There was something else, and I was looking at something else. And I interrupted, and, and anyways, I wanted to jump back to it before I forgot. Um, we were talking about the heights here, where the front. Uh, oh, you were asking about this the S four and S five if the if the the shape is the same, and it is. As you can see, this you know it says. Um, let me get my annotation out here. Uh, you know, S for tip rib, so that would be the full, the full length here. Um, you know, going all the way back to the tip, and then the S five is the counterweight rib, which would be smaller. Right. Um, no, what I meant is, have you compared the profile between the five plans and the seven plans to make sure he didn't change something to accommodate that forward spar extension? Is it, is it the same profile? Oh uh, yeah, no, he he didn't. Um, so in fact, if you look at my, um, let's see here. Oh, this yeah, this is the seven. Okay, yeah, I guess I have the newer, the updated um, six seven print. The original six seven print didn't have the ex the uh, extended um, front spar. Excuse me, front spar. Um, yeah. So like Greg said, if you run, if you got that straight two and a quarter inch dimension. And that's greater than what the profile is on the S4 rib. Uh, you got a step there to deal with. Yeah, you, you're going to end up. I mean, this will be exaggerated, but your your front spar would be like this. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm really massacring this. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, your front spar would be. Um, it would stick out, right? And you know, right. So you right. you'd have to run this flat all the way across here and then to start your tip, tip taper from here down so but um yeah yeah i haven't pulled those into cad yet to see but um from looking at it i mean they look well here's the seven and let me show oh hang on let me get rid of this annotation thing You just shake the etch a sketch. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to use little features and you know, it's, it's kind of nice. But yeah, if you look at this, there 
they're literally the same drawing, um, you know, just photocopied a few times. Um, they have all the same errors and, and uh, whatnot, so. So. Well, Greg hey, some points. I guess I'll be doing some more looking into that here when I get done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of things there, but um yeah, it's interesting. A lot of parts on these airplanes are they're kind of kind of complex things. So a lot of interrelated parts and it's kind of interesting to go through so anyhow well guys I was just looking at the clock and it's it's almost noon in my little world here so I should get off the phone and feed my son and myself and then get something done so but uh, anyone else have any last minute things before we drop no, are you going to do a Tuesday night or? We did one this last week and yeah, it was pretty well attended. Um, let's see. I need to check my calendar, but I think that should work for me to do. Um, Got but, Glenn Bradley on there for the first time. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was good having him on. He, he kind of went through a few things, answered a bunch of questions, um, you know, talked about the CX-7 um, his uh, you know test process and flight test process and so yeah it was really interesting. Um, so yeah, it's out on YouTube if you guys haven't seen it. So um, yeah, definitely check that out. And it'd be nice to get weekly updates from them on the flight testing. Yeah, yeah, that would. Um, I'm kind of. I don't want to put any more pressure on them to do things than he already has on him. I know he knows there's a lot of people watching. So, um, you know, I want to make sure he's comfortable, you know, taking his time and doing it safely and everything. But, uh, yeah, it'd be great to, to see updates more often. I agree with you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you, are you guys interested in the Tuesday night one again, or is there a, another night that works better? I could do, I could do, I think most weeks, Monday, Tuesday, work best for me, but I could do it. Um, right now I could probably do it Wednesday for a couple weeks here and there. Um, my intention wasn't to do Tuesday and Saturday every week because that's just a lot of, a lot of calls and there's a lot of other things that I personally need to get done. Uh, you know, as far as CAD goes or making parts or that sort of thing. But I also know it's, um, I, I, I enjoy it. Um, and it's, it's beneficial informative so well you're you're not just here to serve us where our every whim and and then satisfy our fantasies for for telling us stuff all the time that's not what your mission in life is ben i mean you know that's my secondary mission you know i, I gotta gotta put have okay. priorities right so <laughs> we thought we were giving well, you a I, lot of practical I, input <laughs> i i i sympathize with you i'm a high school physics teacher and, oh okay you know uh, the kids think I, i'm there for them exclusively, so. Gotcha, yeah. No. I appreciate you doing this, Ben. Yeah, no, this is this has been great for me too. It's been fun to meet, you know, to get, really get to know you guys and stuff, but it's also, um, yeah, it's informative. You know, we're talking through some some issues with these things and talking about engines and everything. I was thinking mm -hmm. that about reaching out to some of these engine manufacturers and just seeing, hey, we're gonna do a call every Saturday morning. Maybe, you know, schedule one Saturday to pop in and you know, let us do a Q&A or something, or maybe, you know, even just have them set up their own call in uh, thing for Q&A or something. Um, I think that'd be, that'd be really useful. Uh, get some of these questions answered. And, um, get or even know. some of those Speaking people of like Ed Klepas and Ernest Martin. Yeah, actually, yeah. I should, you know, that's a really good point, Greg. I should reach out to those guys um, and just uh, see if they- Speaking of engines, I, I, I got a quick question. Anybody familiar with the Limbach? Yeah, we were talking about it on Tuesday, uh, or maybe it was last Saturday, but yeah. Is uh, that a viable <laughs> option? Because yeah, I'm not super familiar. I just, I'm aware that they exist after being told about them recently. So yeah, um, uh, I, it sounds like a couple of guys either have them or are thinking about using them. Yes. So it sounds like 
it's something that's possible. Um, I believe they're just well, okay. based is what I understood, correct? Yes, but there are uh, guys had it on another plane and he said it was fantastic. Okay. Was it the Corby or something like that that he had it on? Yeah, I don't remember what plane he had it on. Okay. He was thinking about yeah, I, I have a lead on I have a lead on one, but trying to get these guys here locally to, you know, I actually talked to the guy who went, oh, I don't know. It's sitting in the back of his hangar on the floor. I'm like, doing what? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Collection dust. Holding down the pellet it's on. Yeah. I guess. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Hey, Go this is, uh, this is Bill Miller. Is can you hear me? Hey, Billy. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got your print up. It's not showing the video. There was some questions oh. last time. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me uh, kill the share and go back to the people. Yeah. All right. um, sorry. Okay. I, I guess I'm there. Uh, last week uh, we was talking about the baffling, and there was a couple people that might have been interested because my engine temperatures are staying uh, low. Oh yeah. And uh, I was going. I had took the cowling off when I got here, and I was going to kind of show the how it looked. Yeah, and if anybody's great. interested. Yeah, I, I pinned your video, so it'll be you know full screen here. So yeah, I yeah, definitely like to see that. And I don't know. Uh, well, I got my video turned on, I thought, but it's not. Uh, yep. Oh, wait a minute. Here you we can go. see it. Yep, there you go. There should be a, on your, uh, on your phone, there should be a button to push to where it'll rotate the switch cameras, basically, to the front camera. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. Oh, I see it. You see that? Mute, stop. Mute stop video or there should share be by stop, content. By stop video, there should be a little arrow, and you should the be able arrows. to um to which camera to use. So you might be I do not. Look. I do not so, see it. Okay. All right. Whichever. I mean, it, it works. We can see your video. I just thought if you flip to the other camera, it'd be easier for you to show us stuff. So that's yeah, all. I, I, um, not a problem. Yeah. All I see is share content participants more. And if I touch more, uh, it just says hide my video. Oh, okay. All right. That's all right. No worries. Can you turn it and show the cylinders? Yeah, if I can, uh, if y'all can see it when I turn it around, it's yeah, going to be can. awful small. It's all right. Yeah, we can see it. The forward part of the cylinders. Yeah, it's, uh, it should be showing it. Exhaust stack only. Oh, it'd be better if it was full screen. Well, for us, it is full screen. Um, oh, okay. Yep. So, or, all right. Or, you know, um, full screen, so the YouTube video, it'll, it'll be full screen. So. Yeah. Is that, uh, does that show anything on the cylinder? Yeah. Yeah. The, the top part of the baffle is up to the exhaust stack. It's not going oh. over the cylinder. Craig, it's about middle ways of the cylinder. Can you move more to the left? The left cylinder? No, more to the, uh, cell, uh, the base. There you go. Back out. Down? Back. Back out. Yeah, there you go. Billy, what cylinder head temp do you run? Uh, anywhere from uh, 350 to 375. Thank you. And the way I did the back, tell me, tell me if you can see it. Does that show up? No. How about that? 
down a little. Yep, down a little bit. Uh, keep going. There you go. I saw on the right side because the top piece that's round that goes up the top, since to the top of the cowling, I had to come in closer to the cylinder. So I bent the piece in and all of my pieces stick down into the little um, trays underneath. Where did you say you picked up your CHT? Which cylinder? My cylinder head temperature? Yeah. It, all right, tell me if you can see that. There's the wire right there. Okay. It's on the uh, back boat in the center. It's on the uh, rear cylinder on the right side, and it's on the front cylinder on the other side. Okay. And I have some little holes. I don't know if you can see them, but I can stick my finger through right there. Hope you got your finger over the camera lens. Oh, that won't be good. <laughs> Makes it hard to see. Okay, so, so you said there's a hole? That yeah, see, I got some little holes that I can close up, like um, right here in the center. Okay. I can close all those holes up, and on the bottom I've got a few that if I actually get a little higher temperature, I can go around there with some black RTV or red RTV and, uh, and close them up. Okay. And other than the, um, like, I don't know if I can get a shot of this. That's underneath. Do you see it? Yep. Okay. We see. Yeah. That's, that, that's the oil cooler. And the little extension that comes out right to the front of the uh, cowling so that all the air through that little smiley goes into the oil cooler. Okay. And if my oil temperature goes up, I've got a few holes there that I could put red RTV in and close. Okay. How many hours do you have on yours, Billy? Pardon? How many hours do you have on yours, on your 6.4? About 60 plus. Okay, all right. See, only time I get the flies like now, and of course it's always turbulent, so the clouds and the wind and everything uh, always affects me. Sometimes I don't fly but 30 minutes. Okay. But I, I used uh, Dave Thatcher's drawing, and uh, if you can see it, uh, I added a piece on here to make it get closer to the cowling and to the front of the engine. Can you move the camera down just a little bit? Yeah, you see uh, two sets of rivets. Um, can you move the camera the down? The top, top, top row uh, holds the uh, rubber on, and the bottom row holds this extra piece on that I had to get up and, and closer. Yeah, rotate down a little bit. Uh, I got a I got a plane getting ready to take off. So he's kind of drowning everybody out. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's what it uh, what it looks like if uh, if anybody was interested in it. Great, thank you. Yep. Was, yeah. Did you, you snap Bill. some pictures and uh, and publish them on the site uh, of the baffling? Yes. Yeah, I can send them out and put them in a message. Uh, might take me two or three tries, but I can get them there. <laughs> That's all right. Sounds good. That would be appreciated. Okay. Very much. I can do that. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Good deal. Yeah, thanks, Billy. I appreciate you, appreciate you speaking up and, and showing us that. It's good. Yeah, I got here a little late, but uh, I took the cowling off as soon as I got here. And, of course, on my cowling, I had to put a bump, a bubble. Uh, if you see that one, can you see the – that's my electronic ignition, a CompuFire in my mechanical fuel pump. Okay. And I had to put a bubble on the canopy. I don't know if you can see it or not. 
Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. That's what covers that up. And then my underneath, I had to put a little bump on the bottom of the cowling that uh, wouldn't let my carb heat open up. Oh, so I, had, okay. I had to put a little bump on that. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing, Billy. Sure. Guys, no problem. I better scoot here. So good to see everybody, and thanks for the good conversation. So um, thanks, man. If you guys are everybody. interested, I'll try, I'll try and set one up for this coming Tuesday as well, and uh, we can go over some other stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks. Have a good Saturday, everybody. Have a good weekend. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. Thanks. All right.